All right, so you guys might have noticed this truck or this 4Runner kind of just up here on the channel. And as you can see, the hood is currently open and that is because you might have noticed in the last video, she started smoking. <laughs> Brought to you in part by Alpine Toyota. So as you guys might know, these three liters have a very notorious problem, which is blowing head gaskets. And that is what we have suspected has happened to this guy. And to fix that, well, we could do head gaskets, but you know what makes a lot more sense? Throw a 3.4 in it. It costs about the same to like find a junkyard 3.4 as it does to properly do the head gaskets with head studs and like seal kit and all that. So it's kind of a might as well because you get more power, better fuel economy, overall smoother just driving experience and 3.4s love the rev limiter. And because there's actually two of us that are gonna be working on this 3-4 swap, I think it gives us a decent opportunity here to actually document it a little bit better than I have in the past. So first off, we're gonna start by making room to get this motor out. So we'll take the hood off because it's easy and unlocks a whole bunch of room. And then up to the battery, radiator, air box, all this stuff up here. And once all that is out of the way, we'll move on to, well, everything else. It is way easier when you're mocking up motor mount. Yep. Yep. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> It's coming. Yep. Make sure you use a line wrench when removing the fuel line from alongside the frame rail. This guy is extremely easy to strip and you will need to tie into it later. Simply unbolt the power steering lines. These will work with the 3.4 pump. And then make sure you don't lose those two copper gaskets. There goes one. Yeah, I just heard that. <laughs> yeah, we'll go one. Perfect. Here we're just disconnecting the various heater hoses, vacuum hoses, and then the throttle cable. So with the swap, we're not gonna run cruise control, so we're gonna get rid of this cruise control module. Also, with three, four swaps, you get rid of all of this vacuum junk. And like, this guy too, get rid of it. Pretty much everything that's bolted here, <laughs> we'll get rid of. Now as far as disconnecting the computer, we'll take the kick panel off. 
So if you unplug these, one, two, three, and disconnect it from the body harness, you'll be able to pull this whole harness back out and uh, through the firewall. Perfect. No, you just need force. All right, so as you can see, all that junk that was in here is deleted. The engine harness is out here in the engine bay, and uh, we're making moves. So next up on the list, we are tackling the harness going down to the transmission, disconnecting the reverse sensor, the transfer case position sensor, speed sensor, then on to bell housing bolts, engine mounts, and then this sucker's coming out. So I forgot about the starter. We also have to get that off, uh, which is pretty straightforward. That bolt there, and there's a bolt coming from this side right in there. And then for bell housing bolts, you can see the big guy right there, and there's another one up above it. Up there, you can just see what should be the top on this side. There's a bell housing bolt there and then there's a couple of 14s around the bottom and then it's the same thing on the other side except for you don't need to deal with disconnecting starter obviously oh that's spun yeah that's loose dude that was so that loose. was so loose that was problematically loose yeah like you weren't even on it that looks like we staged it yeah <laughs> like all right i got it cracked loose let's yeah. just get it on video now With the starter removed and the transmission free, the last couple of things to do is unbolt the exhaust, then onto engine mounts. Well, guess what? In theory, in theory, there's probably something that we forgot, but it's ready to come out. So the cherry picker here, as you can see, it's extra beefy, so we shouldn't have any of those issues that um, I've had before. <laughs> You know what I mean. Anyways, let's uh, pull the cherry picker up and get this thing in the air. So as you guys can see, that old three liter is out and we have the three four here sitting on the ground. And before we're ready to kind of slap this thing in, we got a few things to do. And to start, we're just gonna kind of clear the engine bay, get rid of all the stuff that we don't need anymore. For example, this EVAP canister bracket can go away. We're just gonna take all the vacuum lines and coolant hoses and everything off of the firewall, just because I know we're gonna have to reconfigure it all later and there's gonna be a whole lot of room with the 3-4 in there to make it work. So on the 3-4, before it goes in, I'm taking note of what line goes to where as far as coolant goes. So you can see this guy here comes up over and that goes to the valve. I'm gonna take this guy off and then we'll put a quick note on this, labeling it to the valve so we know to attach it to that guy right there. All right, so the next step here on prepping that 3-4 is to start taking everything we need off of the three liter. So the oil pan's coming off, the oil pickup tube is coming off, the clutch is coming off, flywheel, and yeah, I think that's about it. All right, check it out. So this is everything we need to remove from the motor of the three liter. We got the flywheel, clutch, pressure plate, both of the engine mounts. We got the oil pickup. We got the dipstick. This little guy from the dipstick that goes into the block and also the oil pan. And the very last thing that I want to take from the three liter is off of the harness here. We're actually going to cut these two body plugs off. So there we go, we have the 3-4 in the air now, and we're gonna start moving all the stuff from the three liter onto it. Um, to start, this 
is the starter and alternator harness. We're not gonna use this. We're actually gonna use the alternator harness that is on the body harness in the uh, actual 4Runner itself. We are, however, gonna keep the starting harness part of it intact, but we gotta pull it off, pull the alternator stuff from it. Uh, I'm gonna peel it apart, take out the alternator junk. But that guy's coming out because it gets tied into this guy here, the factory alternator harness. Okay, so the alternator and starter harness is now out of the truck. All we need is this main power going to the battery lead and this starter trigger wire, which we are going to cut out of this plug here and everything else will go away. So I'll open this guy up, strip it down to its basics, and then we'll start moving all of the junk that we took off the three liter onto this. So before we pulled the oil pan off the 3-4, we did check the dipstick and it said it was empty and we assumed it would have been empty and drained before this engine was shipped. For, yeah, exactly, for freight. But turns out it still at least had a couple of liters left in it. Pulled the pan off and it spilled everywhere. I mean, yeah, we're idiots. We should have checked the oil any, or we should have just drained it anyways, but here's what it is. All right, so for this oil pickup, it's super straightforward. Uh, the actual pickup tube itself will just bolt right into place. This mount here will almost line up with the mount here. You need to bend it ever so slightly. And this one doesn't line up at all. You just need to bend it up out of the way and rely on the one mount plus being mounted here. It's lots, you'll be fine. So now that the pan is swapped over, it's time to move, move over the dipstick. You see this little guy here? Doesn't that look awfully familiar to this little guy that we removed from the three liter block? It's identical. The only difference is this guy's got a plug in it. So all we need to do is knock this guy out, push this guy in, and then we'll have a spot to put the dipstick. Not this time. Okay, let's see if I can tap it out now. Yeah. Hey. There we go. Perfect. Okay. And now this guy goes in there. In theory. Oh no. no There's an issue. We have to drill that out. We broke it. It looks to me like that's what we did. I thought that this collar came out of the three liter block so easy. It'll come out of the three four, but uh, nope. Nope. It didn't. <laughs> So it looks like we are stuck with pulling the pan and drilling it out or pulling the pan and doing something. As you can see, the pan is off. <laughs> so yeah, we gotta drill out the dipstick hole now just to take that little sleeve out. If you had a newer than I think 98 motor, you'd have to drill this out anyways. But hopefully if you're following along at home, you don't have this kind of luck like we do and it'll just come out. But pro tip, Make sure you get the dipstick moved over before you put the pan back on, just so you know for sure. Hey! What's happening? 
get through. All right, and now that sleeve can go in its home. Look at that. It's seated. So you can see we actually put some RTV around it. We used, yeah, a, 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 a fair bit, a generous amount. Uh, just because we drilled out that hole, we wanted to be sure that it's actually gonna seal. The oil pan slash dipstick disaster is officially dealt with. The oil pan's back on there. And now we're finally moving on. <laughs> Three hours later than scheduled. So next up, we are going to do flywheel, clutch, pressure plate, uh, and we got a new input bearing. So with the 3-4 swap, you can use either the 3-4 or a 3-liter clutch kit. But if you're using the 3-4 flywheel, you have to use the 3-4 clutch. You have to use the 3-4 starter as well. And vice versa, if you're using the 3-liter three, three clutch, you obviously have to use the 3-liter starter. The only exception is if you use a 3-4 clutch kit, you have to use a 3-liter throwout bearing so that the clutch actually engages properly. But in our case, Trevor actually replaced the clutch really recently in this thing, so we're just gonna reuse that. And the last things to bolt to the 3.4 are those engine mounts we took off the 3 liter engine earlier. But it looks to the yeah. All right, so motor mounts are officially on this motor and we are so close to dropping it in. The last piece of the puzzle is actually the crossover for the exhaust. Now, Trevor paid for just a prefabricated one. You can make these yourself. Well, you can modify the ones that actually come on the three fours pretty easily. Um, I'll leave a link to a forum post on how to do that in the description. All right, so as you can see here, the three four is entirely dressed up and ready to, well, go into its final resting place in the engine bay. All right, so now we're looking at day three here, working on the 3-4 SWAT. Yesterday didn't go entirely as planned, uh, mostly just based around moving the dipstick. But today, well, today I'm feeling good. So first off, we are starting with connecting fuel lines here. Uh, what Trevor's holding right there is the uh, high pressure fuel line going into the fuel rail. And we are going to connect that, well, to be honest, a pretty jank way <laughs> to get it running hey, for now. Nothing wrong with this. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to use this, which is a T, yes, but we're using it as a coupler. See the cap on the end there? So we are going to cut that line that he's holding in his hand there as far up as we can, put one side of the coupler on there, and then we'll go over to the three liter high pressure line here that also goes to the fuel rail in here. We'll cut this, leaving absolutely as much slack as we can and put the other side of the coupler here. And then this will drop down and connect to the fuel line down at the frame rail. So we're just starting off here. We are fishing this fuel line over to the other side because on the forerunner that this engine came from, the fuel lines actually come up over on this inner fender. Whereas on these older pickups, or older forerunners, <laughs> they drop over here. here. So now go. this is on the correct side. So the same deal goes with the return line, which is this guy there. We'll cross that over, and that actually goes to this line right there that comes up by the firewall. The return here is routed over. You can see it's got the hard line attached to it here, to the soft line. The beauty about where it's positioned now, we can just take the factory return line here, 
and attach that to the hard line instead. And we've got all the length in the world to do that. There we go. The Done. fuel's got to return. So that the return is fed, we're going to work on the high pressure. So as I mentioned, we're going to cut it pretty close to the end there so we have as much slack as possible. Okay. And this guy right here is the high pressure that goes down to the frame rail. So we'll cut that up here. So that is the coupler. <laughs> awesome. Now that just needs a couple of gear clamps. And you can see this is where that drops off to. And that attaches back onto this guy. The three liter alternator harness, which is this guy here, just plugged right into the 3.4. It was the same plug. I have a feeling because this is a 94, it's a later three liter, and this engine's a 96, maybe Toyota changed that plug or changed the alternator in later years, because I swear on my 89, I just switched that plug. So you might have to do it, you might not. So now it's time for me to move on to the wiring side of things. And while I'm doing that, Trevor's gonna crawl underneath it and just finish bolting up the transmission to the engine, and he's gonna throw the starter in. Um, now remember, we use the three liter clutch and flywheel, so we need to use the three liter starter as well. First things first, I'm gonna make myself some room here. And now that I've made room in the cab, it is time to fish this harness down into that hole right there. Uh, but before I can do that, I need to get this steel grommet thing off the end. So I'm going to take a razor blade, cut around here, and try to feed it out. Okay, thank you. Ha! So this guy here, this is the starting harness that used to be part of the alternator harness that I showed you earlier off the 3-4. So now the engine's in, we'll plug the, alter, or we'll plug the starter in, uh, both its power lead and its trigger wire, route this over the front of the engine like it was from factory, and we'll have this up and just kind of resting on the inner fender up here and I'll tie into it later. And now you can see in here, so this is that harness I fished in the firewall. These three here are the ECM plugs. We will kind of sort of plug this in. And there, perfect. So those plug in just like that. And the three plugs that are remaining off of that harness that we brought in are the body side plugs. And these are pretty much what I need to tie into these factory body side plugs. These ends were cut off that three liter engine harness. So yeah, I'll just have to cut these guys. I'll probably find some plugs so that I can make it more of an adapter harness instead of just hardwiring everything. Oh, and this last plug going into ECM was sent to us exactly like this. This would have been cut off the body harness that the three four came with. And this is where we will give the ECM power, switch power, the OBD2 port comes through this. And I think that's it, but let's look at the diagrams and figure that out. So this diagram right here is the engine control diagram for the 3-4. And if we go through, we can see where I have already marked what we are going to need to tie into. So for example, right here, uh, right off the bat, we have this B+. B plus just means that it wants a switched power. And there's also a BAT, B-A-T-T, -T, which just means that this is a constant power. And if you look, that said it is in plug D, which is this very last plug in the ECM. So there should be a white and blue wire right there. That is our switch power. And there should be a black and white wire, which is right there. That guy we will give constant power to. And then with that, the ECM will be powered and ready to go. So unfortunately, the ECM isn't the only thing that we need to get power to to make sure it runs. We need to get things like all of the sensors, the injectors, uh, the coil packs and stuff like that. So right off the bat here, we can see the injectors, one, two, three, four, five, six, come up through this uh, black and red wire that continues forward, continues forward. And we can see that it also powers 
the ignition coils here. So if we follow this guy back, 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 we can see that that black and red wire that powers the injectors and ignition coils is in this II3 plug, which is one of those body plugs that we fished into the cab with the engine harness. And if we go back to this page here, we can see your idle air control valve, VSV, um, data link connectors, your uh, O2 sensors and stuff like that gets powered off of a white and blue wire here. Boom, 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 boom. Follow that guy back. Uh, it also powers your mass airflow sensor. Keep going back. And what do you know? Comes up into the II3 plug. So in that same plug that powered the fuel injectors, we will see this uh, white and blue wire that powers everything else. And moving into the cab, this here is that II3 body plug we just talked about. See, this is attached to the 3-4 harness that we fished in the firewall earlier. And if we look, okay, right there, that is the white and blue wire that we need to give power to for all of these sensors and stuff. And oh, right there, a little bit trickier to see right there is, is the black and red wire that we need to give power to for the injectors and coils. We are essentially gonna run this engine in kind of a standalone configuration. We're not gonna tie into the factory fuse box. It's gonna have its own fuses and relays to just be responsible for itself and nothing else. And realistically, the only wire that is a constant wire is the one labeled BAT and those diagrams that goes into the ECM. So that will get its own fuse and it'll go straight to the ECU. That one will be done. Whereas the rest of them, like the coil packs and igniters, stuff like that, you don't want to have constant power going to. So we are going to throw relays in line uh, so that they'll only turn on when the key is in the on position. I'll have one relay responsible for the ECM and I'll have another relay responsible for the injectors and coils. All right, so Trevor's just here uh, putting the power steering lines together. We're actually using the factory lines that came with this 4Runner. They bolt right up to the 3.4 power steering pump, but you need to use the banjo bolt that came with your three liter line. So here's what I've done. For wiring, I pretty much broke it down super easy. I got a yellow wire going to the battery directly with its own fuse right there, done. I got the white wire for that's gonna control the sensors and the B plus on a switch through a relay and a red wire is for the injector and coils, same deal. It is switch power through a relay. And if you look here, there's a loom crossing here all the way across up here and over to the relays here that then have this guy, bit of loom, that's gonna fish into the firewall. And, that, and this loom's gonna pick up and give power to, well, everything we talked about earlier. It's just wired through a couple of relays and done. This stuff is extremely basic. As I said, there's only that like five or so wires that need power and like you're good to start this thing. It is a lot easier than you'd think. So this guy here, I pulled out of there. And this used to be attached to it at the bottom there. So since we're upgrading this, I broke that off and we'll just put an eyelet on the new wire, tie it to there, ram it all back into its home and run it across. Now the whole reason I'm upgrading this wire in the first place is because the battery now lives on the complete opposite side of the engine bay because the new airbox location takes place where the battery used to be. I got like all of the wiring pretty much mocked up now and we are this close to ready to start. The last thing we have to do is to ground the igniter. <laughs> Done. <laughs> In theory, we're good to start this thing. Everything's connected. Uh, we're gonna check one more time for fuel leaks and then, well, we're gonna see how it works. All right, take two. I didn't plug the freaking computer in. <laughs> Duh. All right. I'm about 15% more confident in this starting. I was 100% confident that it was gonna start the first time though. Alright, 
so here's how I got it to start. So that starter trigger wire that I showed you off the alternator harness is tied into this guy here, this big old black and white wire off of the factory three liter body plugs here. And that allowed us to turn it over. And the wire I tapped into to get the relays to trigger at the right time is this white and red wire that is also in that exact same plug. And if the relays triggered, they then give power to the ECU and the injectors and stuff through this harness right here. Now to get your gauges working, this is super simple. I usually print off the combination meter diagrams for both vehicles. Um, and then this will have, the combination meter is your gauge cluster essentially. And if you look right here, water temp, that is a yellow and red wire going into II3. Does that sound familiar? That is the exact same plug we had to tie into earlier to give power to like the injectors and coils and stuff like that. And if you look over here, TAC, black wire, same plug, II3. And move over to oil pressure sensor, right there, green and white, same plug, II3. So if we move over into the vehicle here, you can see one, two, three coming off of this plug here. I've already tapped into it. I added a three prong connector and then I connected those guys to the other body plug on the forerunner side because if we look at the diagrams again, you can see here water temperature is the yellow and green wire on the IH2 plug. Uh, same with the TAC is the black wire on the IH2 plug and the oil pressure is on the IH2 plug as well. And this plug right here happens to be the IH2 plug. One, two, three wires tapped in, end of this connector, done. So now we're just uh, setting up the throttle cable here and your stock three liter throttle cable will work absolutely beautiful for this. It'll go right into the factory, exactly. But you might need to bend this bracket to work with it to make it line up properly. And just like that, the throttle cable is in place. For the brake booster, that takes vacuum from right here. You need to put the one-way valve in uh, that's factory on a three liter, and it ties in right there to your brake booster. Super simple. Everything else, pretty well for vacuum, like we've just got it pinched off. We've only got it tied in where we actually need vacuum, which is for like the fuel pressure regulator right here, which is this guy, this big sucker. It goes around the back here and into there and down into the intake. Hopefully this video helps giving you guys an idea of what exactly is involved in doing a 3.4 swap on a three liter Toyota truck or 4Runner. Honestly, it's one of the easiest engine conversions you can do. Essentially everything is completely bolt on. And I know a lot of you guys really like the 1UZ swap from my videos, but if you've never done an engine swap before, I would highly recommend starting with the 3.4 and an upgrade to a V8 in the future if you feel like you really need it. Everything you saw in this video was done in the course of three days. And since then, I've kind of just left Trevor to finish up the 3-4 swap. Uh, there's a bit of tidying to do, you know, throw the radiator stuff back in. But everything remaining is honestly super basic. Anyways, guys, if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. I upload weekly Toyota building, wheeling, and off-roading content. Anyways, I'll catch you next week. Peace. Yes. I'ma get it how I wanna get it, you don't get it I can do anything, I don't got a limit I'ma make my mind up, I'm committed It might take some time, might take a minute I won't give up, I don't give in this shit I do what I want when I wanna do it Call it a power or call it a gift I call it persistence, they're driving some wit uh, I ain't no minute man Good things take time when I'm in it man Give me some time and I'm with a fan Now I'm gone too far from the beginning man I can teach you but you gotta listen I got lessons, all lessons to give them Think the masters are open and wishing and thinking and driven and cutting the ribbon